I was thinking, uh, what was your state of mind going in here? Where like, I wonder if he's gonna be here. Ah, uh, okay, no. Ah, no, no, no. I saw, I saw you outside, and I was like, yeah. Oh, there he is again. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, annoying. I was <laughs> actually looking forward. Oh, finally, my first episode, Bart. But uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the substitute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's gonna be good fun. I mean, obviously, we want to continue this show, even though I'm just taking off for another job in yeah. a parent. Yeah. Um, so we want to continue the show. So we're going to have the substitute and that should be fun. At least then I get to listen to all his mistakes and go like, oh, terrible, terrible. No. Or you're going to be like, <laughs> shit, him. he's really good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm going to be like, no, there's, uh -oh. there, there's going to be this moment where you kind of make this decision in your head. Should we do the best thing for the company and let Bart take over or should we do the egoistic thing and you know keep Mikkel on? You no, know? like it's the equivalent of a pro football player getting an injury and seeing the other person take over and kind of wishing that mm. person will fail so there's yeah. still a slot on the yeah. roster, you know. Okay. That's that's kind of No, we uncovered uh, our biases, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but you know, besides that, we're going to talk uh we're going to talk a bit about sales capacity. Mm -hmm. And basically all the models there and how they're broken. Yep. How they're really terribly broken. No, exactly. And uh, especially, there's a lot of wisdom out there, a lot of, hey, this is how it should be done. We're going to cover that. Um, and then we're going to say how all of that is kind of crap um, and how you need to rethink some of these things. We're going to help you rethinking some of it. Well, it still has merit, but we'll get into why it's crap, mm -hmm. or at least why we see it a bit differently. Yep. So, I mean, the, the good news is um, there is a problem you don't know about yet. At the end of this episode, you'll know about it. You'll also know what to you know do to fix it essentially. But a lot of teams out there, they have a broken setup and they don't even realize it. And we're going to, first off, get into some of those telltale signs. We really want to cover some of those. Yeah. So let's go into this, actually. So um, some of these things, are, um, when you think about it, um, first of all, where, where's some of this coming from? Right before we actually go into the telltale signs, where's yeah. this coming from? So when <laughs> when you're a CFO um, or when you're an FP&A guy or even when you're like a CEO and when you create your your first budget, your your twentieth budget, whatever, you might go and look for, hey, how is this actually being done? What is the best practice about it? Mm -hmm. um, there might be some some things that you uh, can do like you did it before, um, and other things might be just you just go out and and research this a little bit, right? And what you will find <clears throat> is that basically, um, and, and the, the search term will be SaaS budget, SaaS revenue, something like that. Um, what you will find is that everyone is talking about your revenue line item and the sales capacity. You know, those are two things that are sometimes being used, sorry, interchangeably. Um, and uh, sales capacity then here really means... Um, how many AEs or headcounts do you need with a quota? And then there's some cool assumptions around ramp up and, um, and uh, um, attrition of those uh, folks and so forth. How many do you need in order to hit your, your revenue target, right? Mm -hmm. And that is basically creating the capacity. That's the capacity model. Yeah. And when you, um, th this, is, this is being uh, touted and, uh, and, and shouted as the way to do it by basically everyone and i mean like predominantly i'll just say big brand name vcs yeah uh big brand name um uh, you know tech companies in the space yeah. don't want to name anyone uh, but that's basically the standard approach these days and that's um that's what everyone you know already knows right i think that's that's pretty like straightforward when you think about it yeah um and and while i actually so it's important to have that uh, that approach, by the way. But now let's go into some of the symptoms that you might have when um, when you're when you're approaching the problem like that, right? Yeah. When all you do is a capacity model with this is how many AEs I need uh, because this is the the revenue I want to achieve and so forth, right? Mm. And some things that I've you know run into myself, and we can you know we can uh, 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 you know riff a little bit on this, but. One telltale sign I've seen a lot is um, mixed quota completion of reps. Yeah. So that is... So you have some reps that hit 30% and then you have others that hit 300%. Yeah. So all over the place. All over the place. Sometimes it's um, 
Sometimes it's called productivity mm, or a quota achievement. Mm. That usually in plans is being set to 70% or 80% because obviously not everyone should be hitting targets. So that makes a ton of sense. If you look into some uh, benchmarks right now, uh, average quota completion, at least in, you know, last time I looked up um, a specific cohort was 54%. Okay. Wow. Yep. Exactly. I, th I thought I thought it'd be way higher. No, 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 no. Average quota completion right now, and it, it depends on how you slice it in terms of what benchmark you get, but 54%. And uh, many, many times it's probably, you know, lower or slightly higher maybe, you know. Uh, but that is that is one that is mm -hmm. one item. Um, I think another one is uh, channels work in one market but not the other. Yeah. Mm, so the, the the typical example is uh, outbound doesn't work in Germany yeah. or it doesn't work in Europe or it doesn't work in you know <laughs> wherever, um, but it works in this other spot. Yeah. So you have you have two markets and one it works and and the other one it doesn't, and people say like ah yeah it doesn't work because it's um uh, it's a culture thing. Yeah, the excuse. It's a culture <laughs> thing. Uh, people in Germany don't like the phone. They don't want to be cold called. They you know. prefer snail mail. Yeah. No. Well, <laughs> let's talk about that another time. That that is that is that is a telltale sign, right? Um, and you can even you can even take this one level higher up and say um, this market is is hitting target, yeah. and this market is not hitting target. Um, and then you will have people say, well. The market that's hitting, that's obviously our home market. That's where we started. That's where we know the most. Um, and uh, and the other market is just not mature yet. Yeah. I've heard that a couple of times. <laughs> so what does the, it mean? Is not The mature. market is not mature <laughs> yet. Um, and and the logic, you know, for, for this approach is obviously quite convincing. Uh, and, and it makes a ton of sense is, well, you haven't been in the market that long. Mm. Uh, maybe you need to, you know, tweak some product market fits on the product side. Uh, you have maybe um, uh, account executives and, and sales folks that are not that experienced yet. Yeah. They don't know how. You have a new competition maybe. There, there, there are new things to it. Mm. Um, but usually it's um, it's actually kind of something else, right? Yeah. And, and when you then have all of those differences between markets, what you will then also find is you will have difference between uh, their efficiency levels. Yeah, You have markets that have great CAC payback, customer acquisition cost payback, as an efficiency metric, and uh, then you have markets that 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 really don't, right? So it's um, there, there's there's a whole cluster around this, um, and it's it starts with the atomic AE that doesn't hit and does hit, yeah. But really, this is just the micro symptom of the whole thing around it also not working yeah. out, right? <clears throat> there's a lot of smoke appearing, yeah. and I, and I think what's interesting is also one of the points we we discussed was hiring an AE that has a proven track record mm -hmm. and that rep coming in, you'd think the person would perform and then it doesn't happen. It doesn't materialize, which is one of those other cases as well, that something isn't right in the setup. Yeah. And uh, so th there might be some other reasons also why that rep isn't working, right? The no, support network that that person had in Salesforce to hit a million <laughs> and now it's going to your little shop Yeah, and it's not hitting a million. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> There, there, there are a couple of those things around it where, um, where if if you go with the standard definition of a capacity model, of person going in, uh, getting a ramp, and maybe you're generous even in your ramp. Maybe mm. it's like nine months in the mid market. That's pretty good. And uh, maybe you are uh, even good in terms of quota setting. It's you, you're not you're not strict and let's just say simple in the sense of hey, he or she gets a salary of. 200k I need four to five acts of that that's the quota and mm. you don't go about it like that but with a little bit more thought um but still basically pack it on the headcount um that then will result in these things here yeah. right and and if you if you think about it and go through it um you uh, open up a new market and you obviously put salespeople there and they don't perform mm. well why why is that potentially right and if you if you think back now, well, why why is why why is it that those AEs aren't hitting as well as the ones that we have in our established market? 
Well, there's a gazillion reasons for that, probably. Mm -hmm. Some of that, you know, product market fit, but some of that might also just be funnel related. Yeah. Um, in, in your home market, you will have a lot of um, direct traffic. You will have a lot of branded search on your brand. Mm. People know you. Uh, they have heard about you. There might be a word of mouth thing happening yeah. in, in your region. Um, so we'll get some, let's just say, free inbound, if you will, that that you can't expect in a new market mm -hmm. when no one knows you. Um, and then, obviously, your, your SDRs, maybe they're um, having a, a much easier time because people know your brand already, so they'll reach out and they get to their 10, 12 meetings and so forth, and, mm -hmm. and all of that stuff converts. And you build all of this also in one office, and now you're opening up another office where new sales leader sits and so forth. There are many reasons why you would say, like, hey, that 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 potentially doesn't work out. Yeah. So there are all these inconsistencies. They're really symptomatic of something fundamentally broken. And obviously, you know, we lead, we are tilting towards something with the sales capacity. So what is it? What's broken here? Let's get into that. And how do you then start fixing it? Yeah. So what's broken is that sales capacity is forgetting about half of the equation, if you will, to make this work out. Mm. Um capacity and the quota that a sales rep has and how they how it stacks let's call that quota on the street that's mm. i think that's a common term that really is only a um and let's let's kind of use maybe a different metaphor here that really is just the demand for revenue yeah that is that is the demand that you as a as a as a company as a, a go to market engine maybe as a funnel need to satisfy you need mm. to meet that demand and um and it's really important to have enough demand for the stuff that you're creating if you are creating uh too many opportunities and this is really the supply side yeah if you're creating too many opportunities for too few reps on on the demand side um then then that's an issue right so really having that built out in the right way that that is super important but and this is this is my point here. This is our point. Um, that quota on the street is basically not the reason why you will hit a specific revenue number. Mm. It is an enabler to hit that revenue number. If you don't have that, you won't hit that revenue number. Yes, but also at the same time, and this is where supply and demand needs to meet. You need to have enough funnel strength, enough yeah. pipeline to satisfy that demand. Because if you don't, um, then basically what's going to happen is um, you might have quota on the street for a million or 10 million for you know whatever reason, uh, but your pipeline is only generating half of that. Guess what? It's only going to, you know, that that is the number that's going to come, yeah. come out in the end, right? Um, and that is the reason um, when you forget about that and they're not, and I don't think people completely forget about it. I think people are just... Um, skipping over it mm. because it maybe is a bit more easy and hey i read this in this medium post and it's really a respectable guy and you know in vc and you know they did a lot of good investments they see what good looks like and uh, they describe that this is how it works out mm -hmm. and therefore i'll take it and i can't be wrong with that right no. the problem is they are completely totally wrong with that yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's not like we're saying the capacity model doesn't have its place like to your point it is important that you have capacity to close the revenue you need as a business in order to hit yeah. the target. But there's this whole other realm, which is the pipeline, building that for the account execs to be to be successful at the end of the day. And that's not being talked about enough. I think if you go to Google and search for a sales capacity model, every single post or article in there will talk about what we just said in the beginning of the show, ACVs, ramp time, all that stuff. And it's good, but you do need to plan out the supply side. So let's let's maybe get into this piece uh, a bit. How do you how do you go about then? You know, building out this part of the model. Yeah. So the building out the supply side that's very much what um, I think um, we, we've covered in the past. Yeah. In terms of the operating model and, and and maybe listen to that. But the the important piece here is not only that you know that your funnel is able to generate a million AR or 10 million AR in a quarter. Um, the important piece is that you balance that across all the different entities. Yeah. That is the important piece. 
And um, I think the the first step that's kind of, I think everyone should sense check whether or not they're there. Mm. Um, if you're growing a lot, you're probably not there, by the way. Um, and uh, for for CFOs, if, if there's any CFO listening, which I highly doubt, I um, hope. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, then please check out whether or not your funnel can actually support the headcount based capacity model that you build out. Yeah. Right, really, really think about that. But the the reason why some reps hit hit and some don't, why some markets hit and some don't, why some markets are successful, you know, efficiency wise, and some aren't. That is basically because that balancing uh, doesn't happen on that level. No. Yeah. So on the rep level, the reason why some reps hit three hundred percent and some thirty is because they probably get a ten x difference in opportunity supply. Yeah. And why why does that happen? Well, it happens potentially unconsciously. It happens potentially because uh, the sales manager is tilting opportunities one way rather than another. It might also be that one rep is getting all the hot inbounds and one rep is getting the sluggish outbounds. Mm. Um, th those those differences will drive the outcome. And everyone will say like, well, but Tony, they're good sales reps and they're bad sales reps. And that's totally true. But I would challenge any, and I, I have, uh, you know, sometimes I've like 15 minute calls with random folks and they ask me some of those questions and, and usually this AE problem comes up and then I say, but how do you know that that person is actually really bad? Um, they say, well, they, they don't hit their target, obviously. And they haven't <laughs> hit, hit that in like three, six, nine months, whatever. And it's like, well, have you checked how many opportunities they got versus the other yeah. folks? Have you checked that? Yeah, yeah. And the answer is usually no. Yeah. It's, it's mind blown. It's like, oh, wow, I should probably check that. Yeah. yeah and yes, you should. Yes, you should. And you should also check the uh, pipeline sources yeah. uh, of those opportunities because inbound is usually working easier and better. It's shorter sales cycles, meaning you can you know, process more of them at the same time, mm. um, et cetera. We, let's not go into that. But check first whether or not the supply of opportunities that they're getting is is fundamentally different. And yeah. then actually you should adjust for that. Mm. Right? Is, is that person getting 20 opportunities and converting 10 of them for a super high ACV and still only getting to 30% yeah. versus the other person getting, I don't 200 <laughs> opportunities, whatever, uh, lower conversion rate, lower ACV, just, you know, discounting the, the crap out of it and closing it. Yeah. Um, and maybe that is leading to that result, right? And the list goes on. That yeah. applies for your different markets. Segments even. We talk it, like enterprise it, mid market. It, it goes for that as well. It goes for, um, and this is a little bit backwards uh, or, or, or less obvious. It goes for um, the different channels. Yeah, so why is that? Well, I've seen this now many, many times. I've also experienced it myself. Mm. Screwed this up really nicely. <laughs> um, basically, if you have a setup where you are giving... Um, lots of inbound opportunities to um, uh, one team and then adding outbound opportunities to it. Um, and usually this will be your home market usually, right? Mm -hmm. You have your home market, there's nice inbound coming in, you want to set up this outbound motion and suddenly you start pushing in outbounds. The reps usually that are, uh, in that case, probably really well satisfied in terms of uh, supply, they will basically find 20,000 reasons why those outbound opportunities cannot work because they do take more time. They mm. are a little bit more shit, yeah. right? And it's, I make fun of this, but it's really the, if you're used to inbound, you start an inbound demo with, hey, what is it that you want to find out today? Why are you here? You know, those those really nice opening up questions. And, and the other side will be like, well, I have this problem, I mm. blah. If you ask the same question in an outbound meeting, and it, you know, and sometimes it obviously lands wrong, but you might get answers back like, well, your freaking SDR, you know, got <laughs> me to me. show up here. <laughs> That's the reason. I don't have a problem. <laughs> have, have fun, have fun yeah. taking that meeting forward, by the way. And if you're not used to that, then that, that will be an issue. But then vice versa, surprisingly, uh, you have another market. Maybe that's newer. Yeah. Uh, maybe they're... Uh, more hungry reps around, 
You give them outbound opportunities and see there, the channel works out. Yeah. And and again, the reason is um, uh, the, this, the demand side is actually not big enough in order to consume those, you know, outbound supply side pieces mm. in one market and therefore the channel doesn't work out. Yeah. And you might have in another market the complete opposite problem, actually. Uh, and again, right? So, so the the these these micro details. It's um, I, I recently heard this kind of. Uh, um, we should have done better research on this, but it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's basically something that happens on the micro level that mirrors itself randomly on the top level as well. It's kind of this snowflake. If you look at a snowflake under the microscope, mm. you have the the ends of it. They yeah. kind of look the exact same as the, the overall shape of the snowflake. And it's kind of the same here, actually. If you have AEs not balancing out, yeah. you might have uh, markets that aren't balancing out. Um, and if you... By the way, why, why should you care if something isn't balancing out? Well, it is a major efficiency problem. Yeah. If you have too much demand for too little supply, you basically that gap in between, you could have frankly fired those AEs, taken that nice cash and put it into more supply. You would have more money now, yeah. better CAC payback. And the other way around, you have uh, you know too much supply for too few AEs. Well, either you are able to figure out how to increase quota or find some other tips or something like that to 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 get this up. Um, and then I think it's doable for a quarter or two, especially if you have some fluctuation in the team. But generally speaking, you should have taken some some of that supply will now be converted worse. Yeah. And you left CAC on the table. <laughs> you left CAC on the table. <laughs> you left cash. It's a customer acquisition cost on the table. You could have spent more wisely. Mm -hmm. So it's it is a problem, and especially these days, it's a problem yeah. when you need to be more careful with that stuff. And I think it's so a couple of things. We've talked about the challenge of being that trusted partner, being seen as more strategic. If you're being involved in sales capacity planning, you can take it a step further and look at the supply side here. What should that dynamic be? If the revenue number is X and we need this quota on the street, well, what needs to happen on the supply side? Because it needs to be in balance. And I think it's it's absolutely hilarious. We've talked a lot about internally. People frequently ask, what is the optimal SDR to AE ratio. And it's not really about that. It's, a, it, it's about the supply and demand at the end of the day. Yeah. So everyone is asking this. Yeah. AE to SDR ratio. What, Tony, what is what is the number? Yeah. Give a, just it, give us a number, please. Yeah. Is it uh, is it one to two? Yeah. Um, and my answer is always like, what do you mean? One A to two SDRs or two SDRs, uh, to, two A's to one A? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Monday. You forgot your coffee today. <laughs> Go again. We probably need to cut that out. <laughs> nah. uh, is it is it one AE to two SDRs or is it two AEs to one SDR? Yeah. And then they kind of say something, but but in the end, it's it doesn't matter if if this is if this is your question, you don't understand the whole problem. No. Uh, and it sounds super arrogant when I say it, and I kind of did one or two LinkedIn posts on this. It was like, hey, this is the wrong question. Blah blah blah. And it it really is though because if you if you are asking about how to structure your team, mm. um, and this is this is the crux you get to in the end. Yeah. Really, really, what happened here is the following: uh, CFO created this headcount plan of capacity, uh, VP of sales, and said, "Well, we need some SDRs to support it." And just as you have like this formulaic approach to. Uh, okay, uh, one AE and quota and RAM gives me this line. Um, and now, now that I have 10, 20 AEs or something like that, mm. I now need to understand what I need to multiply that number by in order to get to my SDI yeah. that is that That is the exact situation that happens there. And then in the management team, there's a fight ensuing on what that number should be. And the VP of sales will always try and push it up. The CFO will always try and push it down. And then the conversation is, okay, well, let's go and do some, you know, get a benchmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? This is the most useless benchmark you can try and pull. Yeah. Uh, because it's 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 just going to be wrong all over the place. And and the coolest thing is uh, the, um, well, I'm not sure if it's the coolest thing, but the CFO will come back and uh, she will cite Salesforce and say, well, Salesforce they have, uh, I think there's something ridiculous. Uh, they have four AEs and one SDR. Oh. 
<laughs> then you also just know they're way ahead. <laughs> that 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 should be our ratio, yeah. right? If if Salesforce can do it, why can't we do it? Yeah. Uh, and then the the uh, VP of Sales will come back and be like, "Well, I actually think, funny enough, I think it should be one AE and four SDRs. Mm. So the opposite, right? And these guys are just not they're not getting closer no. by any means. And then it's like, okay, well, let's ask someone that knows something about this, Tony. Uh, apparently, oh, I thought you were gonna take the fall guy. <laughs> no, no, it's it's for the fall fall moment. Um, and um, uh, and and then it's like, hey, kind of so solve solve this riddle for us. And then I take them through this whole supply demand thing, and it you know you see how it's over the head sometimes. But that's that's the problem here, right? And yeah. the problem is again, you're in the spreadsheet, you have this headcount line item, you need to decide on another headcount line item, mm. and you just can't figure it out. But it also becomes kind of simple math if you think about it four AEs, one SDR, what is the productivity of one SDR? So I'm an account exec and I get to work on two ups next month. <laughs> so the thing so the funny thing is no one is ever asking the AEs. No. Yeah. No. And no. and you know, and they're biased in so many ways. And it's it's always like, oh, they would just want more and easier time and so forth. But again, and I said this a couple of times on this show, it's like you don't want to hear it, but sometimes talk to them yeah. and there is a really interesting kernel of truth in there and they will tell you, I mean, first of all, they will tell you that all of the SDR ops are shit. Yeah. That will be the first thing out of their mouth. Um, but, you know, once you're past that point, you're like, okay, let's pretend they're not shit because actually you're converting 10, 15% of those. Yeah. Uh, you know, thank you very much. Um, then it's, well, how many of them do you actually need? And and they do some quick back of the napkin kind of math, and yeah. they say, well, I need you know so many opportunities, and those SDRs, you know, on a good day, maybe they do this. Mm. So I think I need two and a half. Yep. And that is probably a much better conversation yeah. than the CFO and the VP of Sales will ever have had in 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 their executive meetings. By the way, you will learn a lot from spending time on the floor. Sales is at the the tricky thing is. The tricky thing is you need to know, you need to figure out a way uh, to decide what is good input, what is bad input. Mm. And that's, I granted, that's very difficult because all of those salespeople, and I love them and I hate them, they're just really good at selling whatever. Yeah, They're selling this product, great, but they're also selling their path to success. Yeah, yeah. And they will do both really convincingly. And it's really difficult to figure out, shit, you know, what is the right thing? Yeah, here? where's the bias? Yeah. So we've recently launched an episode on all models are broken mm. because we we kind of realized that this approach to sales capacity is not a one-off it is a model you do need a model for it right so we in the beginning we did this once as an analysis mm. and then we realized pff, we need to do this again every quarter more or less because you have fluctuation in the team you have Conversion rates going up and down. Yeah. You have maybe you want to work on your quota and improve that. And you have, you have, seasonality. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, Park it. that's such Cut an it. excuse. We, we're editing it out. Sorry. Um, out. And uh, and then we started incorporating into the model basically, yeah. right? So um, you have a fairly extensive operating model covering the funnel. Mm. You know how are things going from traffic to leads to opportunities, uh, outbound headcounts and so forth to to revenue at what time? Yeah, and then uh, that that revenue needs to be matched with the quota mm. for that time frame, and that is always a moving target. Yeah. Um, and if you if you spend time and look out three to six months, adjust it a little bit. Um, if you spend time and think about what if that rep leaves, what if we take you know those SDRs up and and make them AEs mm. because what what will happen there your supply will go down and your demand will go up yeah uh, so that's a that's an interesting situation all the time and and once you kind of play around with this what you will realize is um, while I'm trash talking the demand side quote on the street a lot uh, what you will realize it's probably one of the hardest assets to build up over time yeah uh, because you always want to keep it on the edge you always want to be super efficient but you will always have reps leave um, and and building this out well, uh, it requires you to be a bit inefficient, actually. Mm. Um, and I think, um, you know, playing around with a model like that uh, will actually give you some of those insights and show you the trade-offs. Yeah. Well, if we don't do that and let's just say not one but two leave, yeah. then we actually won't have enough capacity for Q4, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other way around also um, is... Um, uh, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how much 
how much stuff comes through the funnel yeah and um do we you know do we have opportunities here to take some headcount away out of the uh, capacity side and put it actually into mm. the funnel potentially right i wonder if we're going to see now that a bunch of articles are going to be updated around sales capacity well they should <laughs> i think i think to be honest i think some of this article stuff is the reason why so many people are messing up their years yeah. honestly and whenever i talk to vcs uh, I bring this up all the time. And in the beginning, like a year ago, I was like, yeah, you know, and some people are still like AEs times quota. And, yeah. and and you know, the VCs giggle and it's like, yeah, that's totally stupid. <laughs> and then they go back, quick, fix yeah. it. <laughs> and now now a year later, I am I basically changed my tune. It's like, it's insane. Everyone is doing it like this. Yeah. And you see like people on the other side nodding. It's like, yeah, I know. And, and some of them are just like, yeah, maybe I'm to blame for that. <laughs> <laughs> I have my hand in causing a lot of pain. Yeah. Hey, you weren't the full guy on this one. No, it's wow. wonderful. Yeah, I, it's sh episode's not over, so don't, <laughs> yeah. don't you know, count your eggs. So we covered a bunch of symptoms. Yeah, basically the smoke, and we also pointed to where the fire is. Hopefully, you are now gonna scroll a bit down in your podcast player and find the episode called "All Models Are Broken." Yeah. And think a bit about how you can build a model. I think this would be super helpful to have in place. It will also change the conversation, like you said, with the CFO. Let's just do some benchmarks mm -hmm. and actually have a productive conversation on how are you going to go and build pipeline for your sales team. Yep. There is a supply side to it. Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. This time, I don't hope it was useful. I know it was <laughs> useful. <laughs> so thanks for listening. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Tony. And... By the way, if you enjoyed this episode of The Last, I think the limit is, what, five, six stars on iTunes, Spotify? Obviously, the highest amount of stars you can give us, 20 stars. we would like to get. Yeah. So rate, rate, rate. We would love it. If you had add any value out of what we've shared, yes. we would enjoy that. We would. It would really help us, actually. So thanks for that. And Keep uh, the motivation going. Yeah, let's, um, you know, looking forward to the next one. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Bye-bye.